good morning, good afternoon to wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Benjamin Bengford. I am the CEO of Rotational Labs, uh, and I'm very excited to host uh, this webinar with our speaker, Edwin Schmier, who is our uh, Chief Operating Officer at Rotational Labs. Uh, before I turn it over to Edwin, uh, just a couple of little housekeeping questions. Uh, so if you guys can see at the bottom of your Zoom, there's a uh, Q&A window. Uh, so if you guys have any questions at all during the uh, the webinar presentation, please feel free to ask them and I'll be monitoring the Q&A and I'll either respond to your questions in the Q&A or when Edwin pauses, I can bring your questions uh, to his attention uh, as we go through. So please feel free um, uh, to use that. Uh, and for those of you who have just joined, we have a poll open. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind taking our quick poll on, on where you are in your AI journey, we'd really appreciate it. <clears throat> so without further ado, let's jump right in. And Edwin, I'll turn it over to you to talk about uh, practical AI strategies for 2024. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction, Benjamin. Very much appreciate it in the setup. Uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So uh, let's start with the framing for this discussion. Uh, this uh, is an internal Google memo that was leaked in roughly May of 2023. And the basic headline here is, we have no moat and neither does OpenAI. Uh, so to be clear, like this is not the official position of Google or the Google leadership team. Uh, it was most likely written by a machine learning a researcher or potentially a staff engineer, uh, I'm sure to, um, assist in some type of internal debate around where um, this whole uh, uh, LLM um, market is going. Um, so the basic crux of this memo is, if you've read it, it talks about uh, open source models and how open source models are changing the competitive landscape um, with respect to uh, LLMs. And what you can see here, I took a, took a very short clip of it which I think is um, very uh, relevant to this discussion. And it talks about the barrier to entry for training and experimentation has dropped uh, from the total output of a major research organization to one person, an evening, and a beefy laptop. Um, so this uh, internal Google memo, when it was leaked, it certainly generated a lot of uh, discussion uh, in the community as to whether uh, how competitive open source models are, uh, and whether or not um, you know, the LLM market and, and essentially the AL market was gonna be um, dominated by a few large providers like OpenAI and Google uh, and Microsoft. Um, so again, it spurred a lot of discussion. Uh, and to that point, I actually have a screenshot here of uh, an individual, his name is Andre Karpathy. Some of you may know him. He used to be the head of machine learning and AI at Tesla. Uh, I think previous to that, he was at OpenAI and Google. Um, <clears throat> right now, I think he's unaff unaff unaffiliated and uh, does a lot of kind of AI uh, education. Um, he has a, um, a good YouTube channel. Uh, so this was a video that he put out recently, maybe about two weeks ago. Um, it's called A Busy Person's Guide to Large Language Models. And in it, he literally shows himself with a beefy laptop running Llama 2, which is an open source model. Um, uh, again, demonstrating that this is actually feasible. Um, the other interesting point here is that, uh, you know, Llama 2, this LLM, uh, consists of two files, uh, basically a, param a parameters, which is basically the data. There's 140 gigabytes of data in there. That's essentially the internet, uh, or most likely the common crawl data set. Uh, and then an executable file that actually runs the LLM. Um, but the point is that, uh, this uh, is uh, very true. I mean, uh, there are people out there with beefy laptops who are running large language models uh, and doing very interesting things. Uh, and in fact, we've done it ourselves uh, for some of our clients. Um, so I just wanted to call this out as like, this is actually happening. This is a reality. Um, and before we talk about uh, moats, uh, I did, I, I should say strategies. I did want to talk a little bit about moats because it can mean different things to different people as well as uh, you know, when, and the word strategy can often be used uh, um, in different ways. And in some ways it can also often have a connotation that uh, uh, let's talk about doing things, but not actually do them. <laughs> so when people ask me what a strategy is, uh, I often use a game analogy. So I often say a strategy is a plan to win. 
uh, which consists of you know a set of um, uh, let's say offensive activities, not the bad offensive, but activities that you can take to press your advantage uh, um, to win in the market, uh, and a set of defensive maneuvers you can take to neutralize your um, your competitors. Uh, but that is not sufficient because it's a plan to win in the game that you choose to play, which you, which means you have to understand uh, and be aware of the underlying market dynamics, the competitive landscape and what your competitors are doing uh, and tie your strategy directly to that. A strategy divorced from the competitive landscape is you know, basically useless. And I just want to highlight two brief case studies here. Uh, there's uh, Geico, which is more of an uh, analog case study, I guess you could say, and a more recent one with what I call chat GPT wrappers. So uh, Geico, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure everybody knows who they are. They are a, uh, the second largest uh, insurer in the US, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, in fact, back in 1999, 2000, they were um, barely in the top 10, I think. Um, so how did they go from barely in the top 10 to number two? Uh, in a relatively short period of time? And the answer is they built a very deep moat using brand strategy. And that brand strategy is visible in the form of the Geico Gecko, which was released or debuted, I should say, in 1999. Uh, and they realized two things. Number one, the competitive landscape was changing rapidly. Uh, there were a lot of new entrants into the insurance market. So how could they differentiate, differentiate themselves? And number two, uh, people don't like buying insurance, full stop. <laughs> uh, it is a you know, product you hope you never wish to use. Uh, so um, what they decided to do is invest in brand to become, um, to, to create instant recall in the mind of the consumer in terms of uh, when, they're when they're shopping for insurance. Um, and they've done this to tremendous effect. They've essentially unleveled the playing field to their advantage uh, using mascots. Um, now, of course, that's not all they've done. They've done a lot of different things to grow, such as moving into other insurance markets, but they have been, been masterful in their use of uh, branding as a differentiator in a competitive market. So, you know, contrast that with what I call chat GPT wrappers. And I have two dates there, November 30th, 2022. That's when OpenAI made chat GPT available. I don't know if the API was available at that time, but um, you know, soon after the OpenAI API was available and a lot of companies started building on top of it. Uh, they started building um, you know, features like uh, PDF summarization, uh, text to image generators, so on and so forth. Well, move forward to November 6th, 2023 and OpenAI had its first uh, dev day. They announced uh, a slew of new features and within 24 hours, probably uh, about half of those companies were out of business. Um, they were entirely dependent on the open, open AI API uh, and also ChatGPT just, uh, so open AI just um, incorporated a lot of those features into their product. Uh, so, you know, there were a, a couple of names going out there that, you know, ChatGPT killed my business, um, but literally they were unable to build, uh, they had a, a moat around their product or service. Um, you know, in fairness, they probably didn't have that much time, but also they chose to play that game. Uh, and the result is that um, a lot of these companies no longer exist. Um, so when we talk about a moat, you know, we're talking about building a sustainable competitive advantage uh, that can last into the future. So the picture I want to paint in your mind here is that, uh, and the premise behind our presentation is that your domain expertise is uh, it, your, your competitive advantage. Uh, and you can you know, imagine your castle as your business, uh, it contains your data, uh, your artifacts, uh, your expertise. Uh, and if you channel that into strategies such as domain specific LLMs, uh, automation, uh, being data agile and enabling your data team, it can result through differentiation uh, uh, with, for example, intellectual property or branding or data curation or customer experience, any number of ways to differentiate. Um, but that's the idea is that you wanna take your domain expertise uh, and go deep with it with um, uh, 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 artificial intelligence. So before we dive into these strategies, just a bit of context, uh, you know, we don't know your budget. Some of these strategies may be uh, um, uh, 
you might be able to fit them into your budget. They may be relevant or irrelevant to your budget. So that's something that you know we 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 uh, assume. Um, you know, your budget is a reflection of your priorities. So if you do uh, say you are an AI company or working with data in some way, then that should show up in your budget. Um, also, you know, a lot of companies are dealing with the end of ZERP. ZERP stands for zero interest rate policy. So essentially the end of cheap money. Um, different companies are uh, dealing with that in different ways. And of course, we're all uh, operating with the AI hype cycle. Um, trying to make sense of all of it. But what we're trying to do is ground these strategies in our experience, uh, what we've uh, seen and done with clients. Uh, and at the same time, uh, also, uh, you should ground the strategies in your product vision. Um, so let's uh, dive into strategy number one, domain-specific LLMs. So why would you want to build a domain-specific LLM? Uh, and the answer should be pretty clear. Uh, you work within uh, a specialized industry with specialized uh, vocabulary, voca um, frameworks, uh, you know, different ways of decision making, uh, and an LLM that is tuned to that specific industry will result in better accuracy and better results, uh, more value. Uh, here are some, you know, we've listed a couple of use cases here that uh, a domain specific LLM uh, uh, could help with. Um, we're not going to enumerate um, them, but you know, again, it goes back to this idea that your industry is specialized, and you could train a model uh, to reflect that. Um, this just gives a little bit idea of the L LLM LLM landscape as uh, it is today. Um, actually, it's a little bit outdated because I think Google just released Gemini a few days ago. Um, but the point here is that, you know, roughly mid-2022, uh, after April 2022, the number of open source models starts to uh, increase substantially uh, compared to the proprietary models. Um, so again, going back to that uh, Google memo, which was released in May of 2023, so, you know, sometime uh, around here, uh, it's interesting to see uh, how the open source um, models are beginning in some ways uh, to, to dominate the conversation. I should also point out on that graph that this is primarily English or Western language focused. Uh, there were a couple of Chinese models listed there, mm -hmm. um, but there is a lot of growth in language models uh, for other types of, for other languages, not English languages, or that are dominated by a different language besides English, because these LLMs can be multilingual um, in, you know, in some senses, um, but that graph is particularly English specific. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so why would you want to consider open source? Uh, three reasons, uh, ownership and control. Um, you don't want to have a dependency on uh, you know, a, another provider. Um, privacy, you might be concerned about the data that you have, and uh, you don't necessarily want to give it over to a third party. Uh, and then third, because of customization. I mean, your, business, your business is not generic, so uh, neither should the models that you use be generic. Um, so provided you have you know, a good use case, you have text data, uh, and apply an open source model, then uh, you, you, know, you could potentially be in a position to start building uh, a, a domain-specific LLM um, for your organization. Uh, and I should also mention that um, when we talk about LLMs, the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of people is a chatbot, but that is not necessarily the only use case, uh, only results uh, or interface that an LLM can have. In fact, we work with clients that have done uh, different things with uh, domain-specific LLMs that haven't resulted in chatbots, but have been incredibly valuable and useful um, in terms of uh, you know, classification and automation. So, you know, if you were going to start with an open source model, where do you go? What platforms do you use? Um, the one that's most prevalent uh, is Hugging Face. Um, so uh, Hugging Face is an, describes themselves as a GitHub for AI and machine learning artifacts. So you can see they have models and data sets, spaces and docs. Uh, you can see uh, also I highlighted here that currently there are 425,503 models currently on Hugging Face. Um, I should also mention that Hugging Face recently raised, uh, I believe, $235 million um, to expand in this market. Um, and uh, their Hugging Face, I should also mention, is not the only open source, open source platform. 
that's out there. Um, there are a few others, uh, for example, Replicate uh, just raised $40 million. I think Together AI raised $135 million. So there are, there's a lot of money flowing into these open source platforms to support open source builders. Um, so they're not going away anytime soon. Uh, and again, I think it goes back to the previous slide, why open source? Uh, so that you can um, have ownership and control, the privacy aspect and the customization. Um, there's a, a lot of belief that's becoming much more uh, important to businesses. Uh, and as a result, you see money flowing into these uh, platforms that are again, supporting open source builders. So in terms of implementation, if you were going to build a domain specific LLM, what would you do? Uh, so you'd have to select an open source LLM and uh, apply the technique of transfer learning. Um, and you know, this we believe is kind of an underused technique. Um, there's a lot of talk about fine tuning, um, but in this particular case, transfer learning is basically taking a set of your data and applying it to an open source model. Uh, I'm not gonna get into the details. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, I suggest signing up for next week's uh, webinar where one of our engineers, Prima Roman, will, uh, who's actually done this, will talk about her experience uh, with building a domain specific LLM and using transfer learning, but it's very much within reach of businesses uh, and kind of an underutilized uh, uh, option that a lot of businesses um, are not looking at, at least in our opinion. And the other thing I want to point out is that this process uh, can be structured, iterative, and repeatable. And of course, if you're in business, you like processes that are structured, iterative, and repeatable. <laughs> Uh, because it lends to you know stability and you and and it lends itself to value generation. So um, you know again, this is uh, building a domain specific LLM goes back to the idea that uh, you are in this industry vertical, you have specialized knowledge, and you can take that and build models that uh, 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 automate a workflow or result in some type of valuable outcome for either your business or for your customers. Um, we've had experience doing this. You know, we took one model from 60% accuracy to 97% accuracy using uh, sort of this recipe or this formula. Um, you know, I, I would say that when we did it, we were probably a little bit surprised uh, about how effective it was. Uh, and I also don't want to oversimplify the process. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into these, into doing these things. Um, but again, it is feasible. It is within reach of a lot of businesses. Um, and again, if I don't want to fixate on the 97% accuracy, that's important, but the most important piece is what did this do for the business? Uh, what did it, what outcomes did it, did it achieve? And when we talked to the client, it was around, uh, you know, the, the response we got was that uh, it fundamentally changed the way they did business in a, in a positive way. It helped uh, uh, um, their on efficiency and productivity and it helped them uh, move. It was a game changer, I guess is the word that they use for them in terms of how they approach their business. So again, within uh, reach within a lot of businesses. And then just a little bit of myth busting here. Uh, Again, going back to this idea that your domain expertise is incredibly valuable, that shows up in the transfer learning. You don't need to use uh, SOTA LLMs. SOTA stands for state-of-the-art models. Uh, and you don't need a ton of data. I mean, that's one thing we hear a lot in terms of a blocker. I just We just don't have enough data. We need to wait until we have enough data. Well, there's no reason to wait. I mean, in this particular case, uh, we used 12 megabits of data to do the training and hyperparameter tuning. Um, uh, so, uh, you probably have the data. Um, you just have to, again, look at how, what business use case you need and how we can, uh, a domain specific LLM can help solve that uh, problem for you. Uh, and then lastly, talk a little bit about augmenting LLMs. And I know this is something Benjamin talks about uh, frequently. So uh, I'll leave it to you, Benjamin, to talk a little about heuristics and RAG. You know, at its core, uh, a large language model uh, predicts the next sequence of text. Uh, you know, given a sequence of text, it predicts the next sequence. Um, and that is great for text generation. Uh, and you can also flip it around to process sort of query inputs. 
Um, and, you know, those are, are very good things, but you have to have this understanding of, of what do you generate and why do you generate those things? So uh, ChatGPT especially uh, has a ton of heuristics uh, that go into deciding what gets generated, what gets emitted. You know, I like to talk about the sort of the early LLMs that were just trained on, on internet data were just absolutely awful because they were regurgitating the internet. So it does take a fair amount of heuristics uh, in order to guide the output process of an LLM uh, or to guide the sort of input process and the query processing that comes, comes from that LLM. And those heuristics, of course, are in your business domain, right? You can't expect some other entity to produce those heuristics or to tune the model to do the kinds of things that, that you're looking for. So um, then, and those heuristics, they might be simple rules, but they might be other models as well. And so often what we see is that, you know, you have suites of models that are operating in concert in order to produce the business outcomes that you're looking for. One of the biggest applications that we're seeing LLMs used for is for retrieval augmented generation uh, or RAGs. Uh, and essentially what this is, is it's a, a prompt engineering technique where uh, you include your with your prompt uh, documents from your own internal knowledge base so that the LLM generates responses uh, that prioritize the content from your internal knowledge base. And so RAGs are great for, uh, you know, a very strategic search um, or uh, different types of, uh, you know, investigation, uh, especially on large data sets, uh, you know, especially if you do have some kind of internal knowledge base or uh, some sort of rich data. Um, and they're also used to uh, improve summarization and uh, sort of real-time generation uh, and to get LLMs, you know, more current, right? Because you can submit current information and say, prioritize these documents uh, rather than other documents. So just an example of, of how you might ensure that your LLMs are well customized to your organization and to your product vision. All right, so moving on to strategy two, uh, automation. So when we talk about automation, uh, we are specifically referring to reinforcement learning. Um, so, uh, we think there are a lot of businesses who are n not looking at reinforcement learning sufficiently enough. Um, I mean, you can argue that, you know, chat GPT and the transformer architecture has kind of sucked the oxygen out of the, out of the room. <laughs> and uh, despite the fact that, you know, chat GPT was trained using RL, RLHF, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, um, but we think businesses should be taking another look at reinforcement learning specifically uh, to automate different types of tasks. So what is reinforcement learning? Um, well, you have, here's a clip of a uh, video that I found on Twitter that I thought was very useful. Uh, of course, it has cute puppies, so it's always nice to look at. Uh, but you have an environment, in this case, an ops course, and you have agents, uh, these puppies, uh, and they are trying to uh, maximize a reward. They're trying to get to the bowl of food in the middle uh, on, the, on, the, on, on the table. Um, so they're learning by trial and error. Um, and again, they're, they're trying to find a, a reward. And if you watch this entire video, some of the puppies actually make it to the bowl of food and it's very nice. Um, but it's uh, an interesting um, uh, uh, analogy when you think about it in the context of your own business. How can you uh, uh, use reinforcement learning, um, how different types of algorithms to automate different workflows? Um, so if you extend that analogy to your business, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a digital agent that operates in a data-driven environment to make decisions uh, that ma maximize reward function. And reinforcement learning really comes into play when supervised learning is not really an option. You don't have the labeled data to, to do it. Um, that said, there are you know, proven and again, accessible algorithms uh, and approaches to businesses um, that are available, that are out there that can be applied uh, to do, to automate uh, and, and uh, for different use cases. Um, so here's just some use cases that we have experience with. Um, uh, again, reinforcement learning works well when super, supervised learning isn't an option and uh, there are different uh, valuable functions that reinforcement learning can help automate um, uh, the workflows or the different types of tasks. 
And we especially believe that reinforcement learning applied with incremental machine learning. So this idea that over time, uh, it, the model can learn uh, in real time. Uh, and uh, there is a, a, that's a powerful combination. And again, lots of proven and accessible algorithmic approaches that are available to businesses um, that can, again, aid automation, uh, that can look at different workflows and, and tasks that can be um, optimized. Um, so Benjamin, would you add anything to reinforcement learning and automation? Um, you know, I'll say that with reinforcement learning in, in particular, you know, what I think that businesses appreciate that approach because you can define uh, the sort of the goodness or the goal. You can define the reward function or the cost function, and you can do that in a number of ways. Um, and so it's very understandable. Um, but then, you know, that also ties in with incremental machine learning. You know, I think that having a human in the loop is incredibly important, even when you have automation and automated processes. Um, because, you know, I don't think any of us are willing to just let, you know, uh, you know, a new hire, <laughs> you know, just uh, take control and responsibility of all the work. And so if you think about some of these machine learning techniques, but, you know, using them for automation, you could sort of think of them like new hires where they do need to be supervised. Um, and, and so you might see a lot of active learning, uh, approaches both in sort of the online incremental machine learning and the reinforcement learning as well to, to sort of guide the process and tune it, or uh, I guess steering would be the term that we might use uh, in, in machine learning, steering the model to, to do appropriate uh, automation on behalf of your business. And the other point to make is uh, that a lot of businesses should be looking at an ensemble approach. Um, so combining different models, um, having them work together, um, you know, there's, there's rarely ever just one model that will um, succeed, you know, that will generate uh, the most value or optimize in the best way. Uh, oftentimes, the models have to uh, work uh, uh, in tandem with each other, um, potentially even steer each other um, uh, to get the best outcome for the business. So I think that's another important point to make when thinking about the different types of models that are accessible to businesses. So before right. we move on to the uh, next strategy, we did have a question. Okay. Uh, so the question was, can custom GPTs be used as a type of, of RAG? Um, and so, you know, what I'll, I guess I'll, I'll respond to that question. And, and if you have any thoughts, Edwin, you can, you can go ahead and do that. And, and the answer is yes. You know, uh, rags, uh, retrieval augmented generation need to be paired with some sort of generative model, right? And so uh, you can use a pre-trained GPT, but I think that what Edwin is suggesting is that you do want to have your own LLM transformed on your own internal data set and yes. use that in conjunction with, with a RAG. Um, what the RAG does, like, and you might say, okay, well, now the model is trained on my data, so shouldn't it produce text or produce images that are related to my data because I've trained it on my data? What the RAG does is it prioritizes the information in the response specifically for that query, right? Um, so you could sort of think of it as, you know, going to um, a research assistant or a research associate in your business, dumping a bunch of documents on their desk and saying, please summarize this for my board meeting tomorrow, right? So even though that research assistant does have domain knowledge, has been trained on all of your business activities, that pile of documents that you're specifically asking them to summarize is like the primary thing that they're going to be looking at when they come up with their response or their generation. So yes, custom GPTs can be used as, uh, in, a, in coordination with RAGs and potentially they should be, <laughs> uh, especially with transformer models uh, so okay. prevalent. Uh, moving on to AI strategy number three, uh, what we call data agility. So um, this really, uh, you know, when we were thinking about how to frame this, um, I mean, the idea of being agile is native to technology companies. Um, Native in the sense that you know we have uh, agile project management, uh, we have uh, continuous uh, integration, co continuous deployment. Um, you know there are you know it shows up in many different ways uh, for building software. And the question is why does that not extend to data? 
Now, of course, data has uh, you know, a lot of concerns around it. There's uh, security, there's privacy, there's governance. Um, but we think that you know, companies that can solve for that, uh, who become, can become more data agile, will be much better situation, much better situated uh, to, again, um, deepen their moat when it comes to building AI-driven uh, products. Um, so one thing, you know, when we work with clients, for example, we ask, you know, where is your data? Oftentimes it's in the cloud. Uh, there are different cloud providers. Uh, I think we're kind of surprised that how often a lot of companies of very different si very, varying different sizes have uh, multi-cloud strategies. Um, uh, sometimes your data can be on-premise, edge, or local. Uh, it can be sitting in a data warehouse, data lake, or data mart. Um, and you know, different environments need access to this type of to to, uh, to different data. Um, but it gets complex. Um, I think that's the the the, the point here is that um, where your data lives can be really hard to figure out sometimes, uh, and it can be a barrier, uh, a, you know, a blocker to working uh, to building different types of products. Uh, and we've actually seen that with some of our clients. It's just been really hard to get the data. Um, you know, and meanwhile, you know. You have any variety of stakeholders who are wondering where the data is uh, and uh, how uh, and how those barriers are slowing down their innovation, how it's slowing down their product vision. Um, so again, going back to this idea of being agile uh, is very important. So when it comes to data agility, uh, I just want to talk about three concepts uh, briefly here. Uh, the first is data flow. So you know, I come from a finance background. In finance, we have a saying that cash is king. I'm sure all of you have heard about heard of it before. Why is cash king? Because uh, you know, cash is liquid. Uh, it's valuable. Uh, it's fungible. Um, but cash sitting in a bank account does nothing uh, unless you're okay with uh, earning the prevailing interest rate um, on on that account. Uh, it's really you know, the, the right uh, framing of it. It's not cash is king, it's cash flow is king. It's what you do with that cash, the activities that it enables uh, for you to go out and you know, hire the talent you need to know, need to hire, invest in uh, uh, different products uh, to deliver valuable services. And then of course the cash comes back to you when customers pay and then you reinvest in the business. It's really cash flow is king, it's not cash is king. And I would extend that uh, uh, to data. It's not data that is valuable, data sitting in a, a warehouse, data sitting in a, a data lake, uh, that's a valuable asset. Uh, it's what you uh, plan to do with that data, what you're going to use it for, how it fits within your product vision. Um, the other idea I wanna borrow from, from finance is this idea of time value of money. So very simple concept. All it means is that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Why? Because of inflation, uh, because of the risk premium, because of opportunity costs. Uh, well, you can. I think you can extend that to data as well. Think about the time value of data. Uh, often the value of data, the, the greatest value of data is when it's first generated. So how do you move that data to the right person or the right process at the right time and place? That those are some of the questions that uh, uh, data uh, that leaders should be thinking about when building their products. Um, that's uh, you know how can they reduce the time to insight? How can they how can they get that to the end user as quickly as possible? Because that's when it's most valuable. On the other hand, uh, data does have historical value, uh, especially when you want to uh, reproduce different experiments, uh, especially when you have compliance requirements. Um, data can have very important historical value. So it doesn't, you know, unlike time value of money, which is unidirectional, you know, it just over time, the value of money uh, uh, inflates or deflates. <laughs> um, it's uh, data is slightly different in the sense that, you know, the, the value of the data can, uh, the highest value of that data can be now when it's first particularly generated, or uh, you also have to think about how that plays into uh, different requirements around compliance and reproducibility, uh, debugging, uh, so on and so forth. So data agility, the first element is data flow. Um, the second idea here is data generation. So there's this class, classic decision in, in, in strategy, do we build or do we buy? Uh, and I would argue that when it comes to data, you should be doing both. Uh, you need to figure out ways to uh, generate first party data. So looking at your apps, looking at your services, uh, what your, um, and the different types of data that's being generated, where it's going, um, how it can be used. 
um, that's first party data that belongs to you, uh, belongs to your organization and gives you uh, more domain um, expertise. It gives you more um, artifacts related to your specific industry. Uh, very important. And at the same time, uh, companies should be looking at third party data. What are some valuable data sources or data sets that you can use to augment your first party data? Um, you know, you, there are data sets that are very specific to, to certain industries. I would also argue that uh, leaders should be looking at uh, data sets in adjacent industries because often those are overlooked uh, and those can be a, a very valuable source of information when paired with your own data. Um, so data generation is another important strategy that I think a lot of leaders should be um, uh, thinking about as they move into 2024. And the last is data quality. Um, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis placed on big data. If you look at a lot of the proprietary models, they're trained on billions and billions and billions of tokens. Uh, but in this particular case, when talking about domain specific LLMs and leveraging your domain um, expertise, uh, focus on data quality. And I just took an excerpt here from uh, from a, a, a paper that you know basically shows how fine tuning data. Uh, smaller, higher quality data is important, especially when you're going to use techniques like transfer learning. Um, so, uh, so Benjamin, is there anything you would add uh, to being data agile? No, I think that was very comprehensive and I, I appreciated all of the uh, metaphors with cash. <laughs> Um, so yeah, going back to this idea that data uh, quality data is important. And you know oftentimes, in businesses, we fixate on metrics. In the data science world, we fixate on the F1 score, but really it's the data quality that matters that's going to move the needle for your business uh, more than uh, an F1 score. So, you know, being a data agile, agile organization results in many different uh, benefits. Uh, again, I'm not gonna enumerate all of these. I just wanna focus on the last two. I already mentioned being compliance forward. Um, the, uh, you know, I think it was last Friday, the EU uh, uh, published or passed, I should say, their set of AI regulations. Um, companies have two years to be, be in compliance. There are pretty high standards that they're setting for businesses to operate uh, and build and launch AI products in the EU. Uh, so being data agile will allow you to comply with those standards uh, and, and expand your business into that particular, um, you know, into those markets. So uh, compliance forward, I think, is, is a really important concept here. Uh, and uh, I should mention that you'll, we'll probably be seeing more of these AI uh, regulations coming out across the world. Uh, typically, the EU leads, uh, you know, look at GDPR, for example. Um, you know, they're, they're very good at exporting regulations. Um, so that's something that I think is important, especially of global expansion on your mind. Uh, and then this idea of backward and forward compatibility. We talk a lot about backward compatibility in, in, uh, in, in building software, but with forward compatibility, um, it's this idea of model swappability. So, you know, models are changing all the time. Um, but if you have quality data sets, then you can essentially take uh, that data set or that data source uh, and drop it into a new model. Um, now I wanna, again, I want to oversimplify the process. It's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, but the point is that you have this uh, way of being modular with different models. Um, you know, we've heard some uh, people, some uh, clients and individuals we talk about being worried about, well, why should I go and do all this stuff if, you know, in two weeks there's going to be a new model out? Well, the idea is like if you had, you, you should be able to be in a position to swap models in and out. And what I have here, like let data sources and let data sets travel, uh, you know, across the different data products and services that, that you're building. So before we move on, any questions on the data agile front? Uh, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, so the first question is how much does it cost to create a custom LLM? You know, uh, do you have like a range of cost? Uh, I mean, I very dependent on the use case, on the data set, on uh, the, the scope. Um, I mean, we've worked with clients uh, developing LLMs anywhere from, you know, I would say, twenty to $60,000, at least initially. Um, and that's going through the entire process. Uh, so I didn't 
we didn't really talk about uh, enumerate the process for uh, creating an L a custom LLM. Um, but you know, there are quite a few steps uh, from understanding the use case to ensuring the data is available to uh, selecting the algorithm. So do, doing a lot of research around the specific algorithm that's needed. And then of course the transfer learning, hyperparameter tuning, um, and then getting it into production. So there's a lot of steps that go in that, in, into that process. But uh, I mean, we have a good phased approach uh, for doing it. And we think um, again, structured, um, uh, Iterative, repeatable, I think, uh, you know, very feasible for a lot of uh, businesses out there. You know, one to three months will get you to a very reasonable uh, MVP, you know, with a, a fairly small data science team, you know, having a data scientist, data engineer, uh, some project management. Uh, okay, we have another question here. Uh, what are some important considerations for data agility? when selecting a cloud or hosted solution for data storage, uh, particularly for an organization that has historically stored all of its data on site? So, I mean, is, I, I guess this sounds like, uh, uh, I mean, I, I guess it so this sounds like a migration question. <laughs> <laughs> Like how do you move data from on-premise to on-cloud to some extent? Um, I mean, the I'll talk about this in a little bit. I mean, the, the answer that I have in my head is around you know tooling, having the right tooling. I mean, there are there are uh, solutions and services out there that allow you to go between uh, on-premise and you know cloud-based data storage solutions. Um, I mean, that's kind of what I'm talking. That's one point I make in the uh, the next AI strategy number four um, is, is investing in the right tools uh, to make sure that you have that agility. Um, I don't know if you'd add any more to that, Benjamin. I mean, if you've if you've been storing all of your data on prem, then likely all of your data is in one single data center, and so I think one of the biggest considerations that when you move to cloud all of a sudden you now have all of these regions where you can store and replicate your data you can have your data in europe and north america and australia and you know different places in asia and with all of the compliance laws uh you know it, it can get tricky to figure out how to go from on-prem into sort of a multi-region wide area world which really is what the cloud is about um uh, you know, so that's that's sort of a provenance question. Uh, security and data access and privacy are always important considerations, and I think that they were probably important considerations for you when you had your data on site as well. But uh, you know, there's a lot more tools and different types of tools in the cloud that help you manage that. Um, and then there's just so many cloud storage systems, and so you you know you might want to ask like, what data you know, what form is in my data? And it's like, is it mostly relational? Is it mostly unstructured? Is it mostly streams? Is it mostly files? Um, and that data format will will really tell you a lot about how you need to structure your data in the cloud. Um, and then finally, you know, don't forget, like how am I gonna query and access my data is, is also an important uh, consideration. Um, you know, and, and the one thing I, I want to say, too, is that as you move your data from on-prem into the cloud, it's going to expand. Like, you're going to be surprised how much duplication occurs as you move your data into different storage systems and things like that. So, um, you know, just one thing to be aware of. All right, the last question, uh, can you talk through an example of how reinforcement learning has been used for some practical automation tasks um, and why regular machine learning uh, couldn't be used? So I guess I can take yeah, this. You're the, you're the practitioner, Benjamin. I'll let you take <laughs> <laughs> um, You know, one of the most common use cases of reinforcement learning on the marketing side is to do uh, A-B testing or, uh, you know, user-based segmentation. Um, and so the problem or, you know, to get to the why regular ML can't be used 
is because you don't have enough information about your user as they come in to do that segmentation. Um, you know, to to personalize the experience of that user, right? You know, you don't you don't have really any information about them as they start using your application. So what reinforcement learning does is it tracks the user's behavior and starts segmenting that user in real time while interacting with the user. Um, so for example, putting you know different prompts in front of the user or giving different recommendations or uh, you know having sort of different uh, you know wording on, on screen, um, uh, you know different locations of like the checkout button, all of these types of things you know are used in, in, in real world applications um, in order to to segment or personalize an experience for a user. Um, so in terms of like, what are the rewards, right? So, you know, the rewards are, you know, if the user is clicking on things, if the user is, is going deeper into your application, if the user is adding things to their cart, um, you know, those are all signals that whatever you're doing is working. Uh, and, you know, signals that things are, aren't working is, you know, if the user is, you know, bouncing off of your site or is, is not responding you know, you'll track those signals and you'll sort of update sort of the global probabilities uh, across all users. So just as a, a quick example of, of market se of like real time market segmentation uh, that happens in a lot of different applications using reinforcement learning. Uh, all right. Well, let's look at our last section, which is um, maximizing ROI on data scientists. So this is a statistic we often talk about, you know, 87% 80, of data science projects never make it to production. Uh, data science is, of course, a science. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation. You wouldn't expect everything to make it to production, um, but still, it's a statistic that we think, uh, you know, is just unacceptable. Um, and that, uh, you know, if there is a business leader uh, running a different function, uh, they probably would not accept this type of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, of outcome. Um, so, you know. Uh, it's important for leaders to look at this and try to understand how to get more of their models in production, generating the return on investment they put into the different uh, models that they have. So why are they not making any production? I mentioned like there's obviously a lot of experimentation that uh, happens in data scientists. There's supposed to be a natural failure rate, so to speak. Um, but there's also different, there are other reasons. Uh, the culture may not uh, be the best for putting pro uh, getting projects into uh, production. Um, there are data silos. We kind of talked about that ar already. And this idea of a lack of collaboration between uh, the different stakeholders who are involved in getting uh, models into production. Um, so we're kind of thinking about this idea of rethinking data teams and this idea of the end-to-end -end data team. So taking an initial data set source, uh, and moving that all the way through you know, to modeling, to deployment, monitor, monitoring, and maintenance. Um, so if you work on, you know, if you're part of a data science team, you're probably thinking, well, oh my gosh, I already have so much on my plate already. How can I possibly do this? You're going to give me more work. Um, and what we would say is yes, and we agree with you. Um, there, you know, it, it, it is a lot. Um, so what part of it is taking too much time? What part of it is so labor intensive or you feel is not value added or redundant? You know, where do you spend the, uh, that time? Where do you spend time um, you know, uh, burning up cycles that, that you think are not generating value for your business? So uh, again, um, this idea of an end-to-end -end data team being empowering them to go from initial data set to deployment and monitoring and maintenance. And a lot of the data teams that we've talked to want to be in this position. They want to see their models in production. They want to see them generating value. Um, so it's an important concept. And so when we're looking at, at this, we talk a lot about data team enablement. So looking at the objectives, the tools, and the partners. And to just briefly talk about objectives, um, you know, it's really important, really important to have a vision that's grounded in the business outcomes. You know, oftentimes in data teams, there's talk about, again, metrics and accuracy and F1 scores and so on and so forth. But having a vision uh, that a data team can buy into is critically important, painting a picture for them. So, you know, for example, let's say you have a uh, some type of, of, of service that you're selling to clients and you, and the sales team goes in and does sales calls, 
uh, and meets with their prospective clients, you know, they sh t telling the data team, like we want to, the sales team uh, wants to be able to walk in and being, uh, show a client a specific data product. Uh, and there's two different worlds in that scenario uh, to a client. Um, so there's the before when the client has no idea about, uh, you know, a particular, uh, for example, risk that they're facing. Um, and then when you demo that your project, your uh, product or your service, there's a um, meaningful shift in their perspective. Uh, so it's illuminating um, to the, the prospective client and you know, painting that picture of a sales team walking in and showing that to a prospective client and having two different worlds. Like that's, a, that's an important part. That vision is very, very important. Um, moving to the other end very quickly on the partner side of it, uh, looking at the different types of partners that could be internal, uh, the data, the DevOps team, for example, very important, bringing them into the conversation and also having uh, uh, working with different types of specialists who have um, you know, expertise in different domains um, that can augment your, your team. Um, but the part I really want to focus on is tools. So uh, we talked about a little bit based on that question that was just asked, but this idea that you know, there are now tools available to data science teams. Um, to help them, uh, again, reduce the labor intensive processes, those that those processes that are barriers or blockers um, that make it uh, really hard to get models into production. So, you know, we think that, you know, the end to end data team has to be augmented with better tooling. And I know there's tool fatigue out there uh, for sure, for sure um, but there are good tools out there. Um, that we think a lot of data teams are not leveraging and can give them uh, a lot of benefit and move the needle in terms of their productivity and uh, getting their models in production and, uh, and maximize the return on investment in, in data science projects. Um, so again, you know, we uh, put to leaders, like imagine this world where your data team uh, can do many different things uh, to maximize the value of the of your different projects. So being able to navigate data, um, being able to work with structured and unstructured data, collaborate, fork and replicate, deploy models to production. Um, we think they're, you know, these things should not be barriers or blockers or take a lot of time. Um, the, the, the valuable time should be spent talking to clients, uh, understanding the different um, use cases, workflows, evaluating different models. Um, not in kind of, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, labor intensive processes and workloads that currently encumber a lot of data science teams. So, uh, let's take a look forward. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Horizon framework. Uh, it's popularized by McKinsey. I'm kind of using it a different way. But think Horizon 1, Horizon 2, and Horizon 3, um, over, looking over different uh, time periods. So everything we talked about from domain-specific LLMs to applying reinforcement learning, uh, being a data agile, and enabling your data team, those are all Horizon 1 objectives. And we think that's where businesses should be paying attention and building in the next two years. Um, because if you look ahead, you know what's going to happen in, Hor in Horizon 2? It's really hard to say because so much is changing. But you can look at leading indicators. So, like for example, one is a statistic that 89% of data is unstructured. So, a lot of data teams, a lot of businesses are very familiar with working with structured data and have gotten a lot of value out of working with structured data. Um, but the real value in the future are the teams that can really take unstructured data and generate value from that. Um, we think. Uh, businesses that become comfortable, that put together the processes uh, to work with unstructured data are going to be, um, they're gonna uh, be able to uh, best the competition. And the other is this idea of a world of 100,000 LLMs. So when I showed you the hugging face uh, screenshot, there were, if you go there, um, there's roughly 425,000 models. If you Search on LLM, there's uh, over 1,300 LLMs um, currently on Hugging Face right now. Now, I can't speak to the quality of all of them. Uh, some of them are older, some of them probably aren't, aren't being used, but the point is you can kind of see that there is going to be a world of a tremendous amount of LLMs, each specifically trained for a specific use case, a specific task, uh, and companies, again, uh, who are um, comfortable and familiar with working with and building LLMs for their specific vertical are going to be in a much better position to leverage that world. Um, and then moving beyond five years, uh, who knows? I mean, there's artificial general intelligence 
which is an idea that's uh, always three to five years away and, until it isn't. Um, so, uh, you know, even if that happens, again, uh, organizations that are working in Horizon One, again, to do to focus on um, LLMs and reinforcement learning, uh, being data agile, enabling their data teams will be in a much better position to leverage the opportunities that happen five years out and out. Um, so I thought this was an interesting quote on um, this idea of uh, diversify, have redundancy, build on multiple models, multiple multiple uh, data sets. Uh, you know, this is you know encapsulates a lot of what we've talked about in terms of leveraging your domain expertise uh, um, uh, to deepen your move. Um, and just a couple principles uh, before we uh, close out here. Uh, on the left is. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, um, you know, he uh, uncovered the universal laws of physics and made amazing contributions to optics and co-founder of calculus and so on and so forth. Well, he almost lost his entire net worth um, uh, because he invested in a company called these, I think it was called the South Sea Company. Uh, and instead of AI, there was this thing called South America and didn't really know much about it and uh, almost put all of his money in it and almost lost his entire net worth. So, uh, the point being, uh, understand what you're getting into. Uh, and if you don't understand, find the partners who can help you. Um, and on the other side is Bill Gates. And he had, uh, you know, he's famous for saying that uh, people or organizations overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years, uh, which I think is just another way of saying it's hard to get started. And uh, your learning, um, you know, accumulates over time. Um, so, uh, but the point is like, you have to get started. You have to start somewhere. You have to start building, uh, and, uh, you'll learn the different, uh, blockers. You'll learn the different, um, uh, uh, speed bumps along the way and the different issues that have to be tackled. And over time, uh, your learning will accelerate and you'll be in a good position. Um, and then of course, always stay grounded in your product vision. Uh, so the moat building recipe we have here is take your, Specialized domain expertise, combine it with agile AL, AI and ML talent, and you will have a sustainable differentiated advantage. Um, so again, stay grounded in the business value and the product vision, um, double down on your industry expertise and achieve data agility. Uh, you want to be the next Geico in your industry. Um, so to close it out in terms of the next steps, um, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but please invite your data teams to our next webinar, uh, Data Science Do's and Don'ts, uh, a week from today, where uh, Prima, uh, ha who has um, uh, experience building these LLMs, so if you do have specific questions about building a custom LLM, she's your person, uh, you can go ahead and register for that. Um, secondly, you know, talk, uh, seek different opinions from uh, you know, different uh, sources. Uh, again, I mentioned the AI hype cycle. There's a lot out there uh, that people are talking about. There are a lot of uh, claims. Um, <laughs> so just take your time to talk to different um, uh, you know, experts, uh, people you trust. Uh, one thing, uh, another thing I would recommend is um, gaining critical perspective on AI and machine learning. Um, I'm recommending a book here called How Data Happened. Uh, very interesting history behind data. We all uh, make assumptions about what data is and uh, it's inherently good. And there is uh, a lot of underlying, this book challenges a lot of underlying assumptions about data. And I think it's important for executives, especially in the tech industry who are uh, focused on creating the future, uh, you know, take time to learn about the past because the, uh, the present is a result of the past and the uh, future will be the result of the decisions and actions that we take in the present. Um, and then lastly, kind of a, uh, another interesting idea um, is setting up what we call a data playground with inside, inside your organization. And this is you know, an opportunity where you can give access to different data sets to, to different teams uh, and let them play and experiment um, and uh, try different, um, uh, try different projects to, to see what can you know, what's viable for, for the business. So um, it's actually you know, not that hard to set up a data playground. Um, and you know, could potentially yield some uh, uh, interesting insights and, and opportunities for businesses. So um, with that said, I think uh, we, we're at our time and uh, thank you for everyone for taking time to join us today and appreciate it. Uh, again, we hope to see you next week uh, for Prima's uh, presentation on data science do's and don'ts. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful uh, week ahead. Thank you, Edwin, and thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, 
we'll be sending out an email with the recording of the video as well as the link uh, that's in the slide right now. And if you have any other further questions or things that you'd like to discuss with us, please feel free to respond to that email uh, or to get in touch with us directly. Great. Thank you, everyone.